दैवी प्रकृति आश्रित वचन क्या मनसो ज्ञापा भूतादीमय son of Hita, those who are not deluded, the great souls, are under the protection of the divine nature. They are fully engaged in devotional service because they know me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, original and inexhaustible. The word Mahatma refers to those who are broad-minded, not cripple-minded. Cripple-minded persons always engage in satisfying their senses. Sometimes expand their activities in order to do good for others through some ism like nationalism, humanitarianism, or altruism. They may reject personal sense gratification for the sense gratification of others, like the members of their family, community or society, either national or international. Actually, all this is extended sense gratification, from personal to communal to social. This may all be very good from the material point of view, but such activities have no spiritual value. The basis of such activity is sense gratification, either personal or extended. Only when a person gratifies the senses of the Supreme Lord can he be called a Mahatma, a broad-minded person. This has 10 and 8 and 10 and 11 pages. An actual instruction is like a sutra. Sutras where teachings are condensed into very concise codes. And those codes have profound meaning that one can go deeper and deeper into. Here, one verse is explained by 11 pages, you could read it. You can go on explaining it more and more. As the lifestyle, a people changes according to their ashram. Ashram means their social status. Social in the sense of there are four social orders in the Vedic society. Being a student, a youth a student, being married, being retired and being renounced. So how these six codes could be practiced or avoided in different ashrams, social orders, civil orders, Obviously, it would vary. Especially between the Grihastas and the, those in the other three are in the more announced. Atyahara. 
this overconsumption. It's interesting, in Mayapur Dam, there's uh, everywhere, well, there's two kinds of Latya mentioned here. One is eating, and the other is, uh, is uh, consuming in general or accumulating that somebody eats more than they need, then become really attached to consumption. Their attachment to the material world will increase. For there's different codes that for many people when they're working. Some people have live very simply and they may not have uh, that many economic resources to begin with, so it's not uh, an issue. For some people they want to accumulate more and more through their business endeavors. The way to purify their endeavors, if their goal is to do something for Krishna, just like this temple was built by the devil of some devotees <clears throat> in the congregation. So that's a way of utilizing the money. Or someone may want to distribute prasadam or do some other kind of seva. The idea is that a percentage of the income is used for Krishna over there survival requirements. Yeah. That way, but one doesn't need to endeavor unless they have a very specific project or endeavoring for which is sanctioned by higher spiritual authorities, then it's not recommended that one should just endeavor so hard to make more and more money. To, well, when it's going to be at the cost of their spiritual life. There should be some time for meditation, for chanting their Jampa meditation, their mantra meditation. Some time for the family, time for taking care of the children grow up to be nice to always. Many different factors and then the time should be allowed to not just accumulating more and more money. Some people have very good karma. And with this, uh, they may have a lot of this much time I'm going to put into making money. And they may be able to make a lot of money in that time. And then other people whose karma is not so good for money. And even if they put in immense quantities of time and they're not be able to accumulate lots of money. Of course, <clears throat> if somebody has, I mean, everyone has a survival requirement, food, clothing, housing, taking care of children's education, and some basic things that you have to do. Beyond that, how much time is going to be given is, uh, is the question here. We shouldn't be able to also be accumulating more than what we can use, or that we're more than what we need at the course of our spiritual life. Second, an over endeavoring for mundane things. Probably will explain all this later, I'll just give a little overview. That are very difficult to obtain. For spiritual life, we want to ensure that we have enough 
energy and time to be able to pursue our Krishna conscious activities. Some people set some very high goals in the mundane world. And of course they're probably rewarded with some of them, those who have succeeded in achieving their goals in various ways, name, fame, money. But then these things are all fleeting and temporary. The over endeavor said some people can do something and, and within a limited endeavor. But if the over endeavor means they put all their time and energy, everything to achieve this mundane goal. And they neglect their spiritual life. And the way they live. Because they may not be able to get back to God at the end of life because they lose all their energy and time for some mundane thing. Sometimes they do something spiritual which requires a tremendous endeavor. That, that's more, that's a different kind of effect. Sometimes it's not clear, it's a spiritual or mundane, they have to, may have started out spiritual, but become mundane later because they're just doing it as a, as a more of an ego thing than that really is something useful for Krishna. Talking unnecessarily about mundane subject matters. Of course, people who are working, obviously during their work, they have to discuss only mundane subject matters. But then those are necessary. It says unnecessary. When we come to the temple, when we come in the association of devotees, we can take a vacation from discussing politics and mundane things. I think it's not really necessary for the temple. And we can discuss about how beautiful the deities are today, we can discuss about questions. Today I came and I asked if anybody has any questions. Nobody has any, hardly anybody has any questions. So we are just in the habit of discussing about Krishna conscious topics. You read the Srimad Bhagavatam, you read the Bhagavad Gita, it's all questions and answers. So, so many questions in Arjuna's mind, so many questions in the different uh, personalities and the Bhagavad Quran, asking so many very interesting questions. If they hadn't asked those questions, we wouldn't have all that information. So the Prajalpa. That includes things like rumor mongering, gossiping, just talking, blue subjects, which can also turn into something more serious like you know, a Vaishnava Apara, which is an offense to the devotees. At the least, it's a waste of time for spiritual diameter. We can start getting one more attached to material things. And you start to gain a taste for just discussing mundane topics and lose your taste for discussing about Krishna. So all day long we have to talk necessary mundane discussions in our business, in our schooling, in our work, and whatever we're doing. So it'd be nice to have a break where we can talk about Krishna. <coughs> we can talk about spiritual topics. To have some time. That's why we recommend that there's a common temple. Let's as much as we can. 
to attend them certain classes, discussion groups, study groups, to hear Hari Bhattam, to have um, house programs and namatas where somebody comes to the house and have kirtan, lecture, some prashad, question and answer. Some bhakti viksha groups, which are groups that are based on mainly creating a team effort, caring for the devotees in the group. There's uh, discussions and uh, on the spiritual topics, training on the devotees, discussion about expanding the movement, what the group can do the health, the temple health, the expansion. And there's another kind of group which is uh, gaining popularity called Counselor Group, where a senior devotee is accepted by everyone as a counselor. And he personally monitors and mentors the development of the people in the group for more of a superior position in the practice of monitoring this there, but it's done more as just an older brother. Or in the council group, it's more like representative of the guru, kind of serious role. So some places use those groups. You have to have someone that everybody accepts to be their mentor on behalf of Guru and Krishna. So these are the three popular groups that are going on now on this one, Namar, Bhaktivikshya, and the Council. And uh, they meet together during the week. Often they meet together in the houses of the Vihastas so that they can have Harikata. Replacing this Pujalpa mode for discussion about Krishna. Niyamagraha. Practicing scripture rules and regulations only for the sake of following them and not for the sake of spiritual advancement. It's something like fanatical. <clears throat> Just following the rules without considering that whether that particular rule is really useful and appropriate for the person whether it's helping them, there are so many rules in the scriptures. And sometimes one rule, like says in emergencies, there are no rules. So life in that circumstances, we have to survive. We don't take meat, fish, egg, onion, and garlic as a dietary home. But uh, there's a history about one Sage who was caught in a drought in the desert and he was about to die and he came across the dead dog. So he took it as Krishna's mercy and ate the dog and survived, got out of the desert and after that resumed his vegetarian. Who knows life and death because he needed? So in that case, what is the what, what, there's a rule that says we're supposed to try to survive. Self-preservation takes priority. And there's another rule that says you be a vegetarian. But if you're about to die because there's no food and there's only food if there is meat. And then anyway, it's a dead dog, I'm not killing an animal. Recently the dog like died in front of So someone they said, you ate me, you brought the wood, but I, I'm alive, you don't know about it. <laughs> Otherwise I'd be dead, I'm not the game by that. <clears throat> so, 
this was called Niya Mahaprabha, being too much fanatical about the rules or also someone who go the other extreme will be too whimsical. And just, uh, ah, that rule doesn't apply to me because this, this gives some very unappropriate reason and not follow. One of the names of Bhakti Yoga is called Bhuti Yoga. Bhuti means intelligence. And one has to learn how to apply one's intelligence in practicing Krishna consciousness or Bhakti Yoga. So all these say they are, it's all a balance. Don't eat too much, don't eat too little either. Some people fast too much and they don't have the strength to do their service. Some people have different metabolisms. They may eat less, they are bigger, so, so many factors. In my airport we have the system that, I mean there's actually, uh, I read in the Navadvip, on, on glories of Navadvip Dham, that everywhere in the world there's this feature that if you overeat, it's an offense. But in my upper, if you overeat the small things, <laughs> you get sick, it's not good though. I mean, you shouldn't even want to make it like this. <laughs> People always like to hear that it was a big feast in my upper. It had to keep everybody busy walking around in all the place. So this all hangs on guidelines. The rules and regulations are guidelines to help us make spiritual advancement. So the one to accept one and reject another. All this is to be one has to develop a higher intelligence of what's really going to be beneficial for my Krishna consciousness. What's, what's uh, appropriate for this particular situation. Associating with the best of the following analysis. Jana Sandhas. Associating with worldly minded persons who are not interested in Krishna consciousness. Of course, during the, during the working time, they go all day long and associating with people like that. I mean, when I first joined the Krishna Conscious Movement, my parents were. Before I joined, my parents were the best shows in the middle of the West here in America. And uh, then when I joined, the temple didn't have any money to pay the rent. So I wasn't used to working outside too much with a rich family. So the told us I had to go out and get a job. And that time there was no books, there was no big congregation to raise give donations. The movement was just one year, two years registered, 1968. So went out to manpower and got these uh, day, day to day jobs. And so I had like, some amazing experiences. I don't want to bore you with them now. <laughs> I can appreciate, especially that kind of labor level. It was very mundane, the topics of discussion and everything else. But uh, what to do? We had to do, we had to earn some money to pay the rent. And <clears throat> even though we were young monks, but that was... So we come back to the temple and we want to really discuss about Krishna. So sometimes when you're working, what can you do? But the idea is that we don't really associate with those people in a very intimate way. Just so friendly, talk with them, and align with them, but then really get into a deep association, revealing the mind, opening the mind. That was and that we kept for other devotees. So association you can also mean when you really as associate with the devotee when they're exchanging uh, spiritual information 
sharing your um, what you want to share about your life and get to know each other better. If you do that kind of more intimate association with someone who is a spiritual aspirant like yourself. Because then you start opening your mind to someone who's a very mundane person, they'll open their mind and you don't really want to hear all the things they have in their mind. (laughs) 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 And so it'll be all about breaking the regular principles. In in the Krishna conscious movement, we respect Women, so we should say women other than our wives is uh, the mothers. Women are called baby, and then the goddess is they're <clears throat> supposed to be seen in a very respectful way, and we should avoid seeing them in a very and exploiting and enjoying mood. Of course, the exception the husband and wife they will have uh, the ships will be respectful, but the obviously they'll be having a conjugal attachment for each other. And by the mundane world, mostly people talk about opposite sex and, and, and some people in a very uh, what to say enjoying mood. Which is not good for a spiritual advancement. Maybe that's changing a bit more in society to some extent, more politically correct, but I don't know what to read. Being very greedy for mundane achievements. Robert said his astrologer had predicted that he could, that uh, he applied himself, he could be a multi-millionaire. Then he met his spiritual master and he made a decision, life decision, that he wouldn't over and ever. For achieving this multi millions, he would give us this a certain amount of time. He wanted time. He published books for a spiritual master back to God and he did it to Rihasta. By what he that he was doing is in Rihasta. So that time, if he had put into his business, maybe he would have made millions. Like the astrologer predicted, but he, he wanted to. Uh, Give his time to the spiritual master. If uh, by the endeavors and the businesses he did, he made money, but it was some for his family, some for Krishna. No doubt. He did spend some in for Krishna, but he didn't become a good millionaire as a Vihasta. The lady he told us as a sannyasi, you know, I have 108 temples all over the world. Each one worth so many much, so many kind of millions. I said, well, that's a sannyasi. I cannot live in, in any one of them. <laughs> More than a few days. <laughs> They're all the property of Krishna. So he would travel around and stay in his temple. In uh, a few days. Then move on. So he told me that uh, he was cursed. Told many things in his books. His rights. That he was cursed by the children's parents. Of the children here in the West. That were upset that their children had become uh, monks. Initially in this kind of we needed the dedicated monks. Uh, Brahmachino, like monks, and that's a term. 
for pushing on the movement, but then after a while, when many people start getting married, and uh, Prabhupada gave a different focus than having people practice from their homes. Initially, they needed some dedicated people to push around, start the movement. So, it's a very good book. This book is uh, talks very seriously about spiritual life.
But one was uh, to be principled with loving business. This is a big issue nowadays. And I was asked to speak at the Indian uh, Institute of Management in Calcutta some years ago about ethics. And, uh, <clears throat> they have a department now on, on human ethics and we found something else also where just like every day in the paper or we or Enron or the different businesses where they cheated in their income tax and cheated in their accounting, they, they, they misled the stock holders and misled the government, misled the people. And then the whole thing collapsed. And now they're, I think recently was found guilty of so many charges. Uh, so obviously they didn't have this realization of people from that uh, Peter Grobas and probably and him that follow their probably higher principles when they do their business. Because otherwise, the karma is so heavy. But not only spiritually you not be successful, but eventually the karma comes around. And uh, so there was. These are little sutras, little principles. And they can be developed into very deep. I get the feeling that this book is meant more for the, uh, or it's, it's studied more for people, like people who are really into spiritual life already. But uh, don't get scared away if some of the things seem too heavy. <laughs> because it can be goals to achieve in the spiritual life. Spiritual life is a um, gradual process. Maybe someone can stop gossiping all at once. You can try. Mm -hmm. Talk more about Krishna. I know we have a set of Jarrett's and my uncle. Janai lost some punk and jumping there in twins. And uh, there is so much, so serious devotees. I don't know if you know, but probably some of the best Pajarians at this point. Being a manager, being a, a, one of the members of the whole like, governing body, and being a local manager in the airport. Many times I have to deal with managing the ships. I remember one time I was talking with, uh, with uh, one of the brothers about the puja, about what was related to him. And then after we finished, we were almost finished with our discussion. Somebody came up and kind of interrupted and started talking about some management issue that wasn't connected to him. I looked back, he was gone. Just like, it, it just went a pleasant. Involved him and start his service. You would waste time to sit there and hear some magic and show us. Especially if it was like some critical complaint about somebody else that wasn't involved in his department. It's just <clears throat> very much uh, careful. So, I give a seminar in the third verse, but then they give a second. Third verse is all the positive things that you should do. Like be enthusiastic, patient, 
Amen. Faith and conviction. How about one drop? What what speed is it moving?
attached to Lord Chaitanya, how Lord Chaitanya, he approached him and Lord Chaitanya told him to stay in his house and uh, be a good example of a materially responsible person while keeping his heart on Krishna. Then he did that, he followed all that. Excuse me. Then he had an idea. And he thought, let me go to see Lord Nityananda. So he went to see Nityananda Prabhu and found him at Panihati, sitting on a, under the big banyan tree on a raised platform, surrounded by many of his associates and senior kirtan singers, Vaishnavas, devotees. So, in that way, <laughs> he prayed his obeisances from a distance. And then Lord Nityananda was informed that some distance Raghunath Das is paying his obeisances. And then Lord Nityananda said, Thief, thief! <laughs> You are coming just like a thief. So 
So now you come here, I'm going to punish you. So somebody shouted out your name and said, come here, I'm going to punish you. Probably jump up and run right there, right? <laughs> I don't think so. So Raghunath Das, his reaction was he just uh, stayed laying down, paying his obeisances. What did I do wrong now? And Nityananda got up and walked over to him and put his lotus feet on the head of Raghunath Das. Harivo! Harivo! In Vedic culture, if it's a guru or Krishna puts his foot on your head. It's considered a very big blessing. That's probably one of the biggest blessings you can get. <coughs> so then, he said, I'm going to punish you. Your punishment is that you have to feed me and my associates here a picnic. I'm a cowherd boy, I like flat, I like to take picnics, bona bojana. So just give us a breakfast snack, it's all those already lunch, but it's like a breakfast snack of flat rice and yogurt and fruits. And also, so this festival then became known as the Danda Mahutsav. Festival of Punishment. <laughs> well, there's actually a festival of blessing Raghunath uh, uh, Das since he was, he did, it wasn't any problem for him to finance a picnic for Lord Nityananda, being a multi millionaire. That wasn't, he took it as a very great blessing. Thank you for watching our videos. Be sure to subscribe to our channel. We publish new videos every day. And don't forget to like and share our channel.